Thank you. Um, so, okay, I admit this title is a bit much. I promise the talk would be simpler. Um, I want to talk to you about the RIMREP data management system, which is the project I'm currently working on. And I'll tell you a bit about that, and I'll tell you about how we are getting a wide range of data of different kinds and using a couple of very nice formats to deal with it. So we are uh, dealing with data about the Great, ba Great Barrier Reef of Australia. And there we have this problem where there's not enough data and there's too much data. So what do I mean with this? Um, there are a number of um, organizations and projects that collect data in and around the Great Barrier Reef. One of these is IMOS, uh, the Integrated Marine Observer System, with a lot of different sensors. Uh, they have lots of data sets, and these data sets get published on the Australian Ocean Data Network, the company we are part of. But there are a bunch of other companies all collecting or generating their own data. Uh, some are big or small. Each of them publishes it on their own platforms with their own standards. Uh, some data is even sitting on some laptop somewhere because some project went out on the reef, collected the data, and then they did some work with it and never actually made it available online. So when someone wants to do some uh, research on the Great Barrier Reef or want to do, wants to do monitoring for uh, government uh, purposes, they find out that they can't have access to all the data they need because they, it's spread across so many different platforms and it uses so many different standards that it's not actually feasible for a single project to deal with all of that unless they spend all the, their time on it. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're spending all of our time going through all the different um, repositories of data about the Great Barrier Reef, collecting it all, we're even trying to collect some of the data that's sitting off the, uh, off the internet and putting it all uh, available on the RIMREP data management system platform. So what's this RIMREP? Um, it's the RIF 2050 <coughs> Integrated uh, Monitoring and Reporting Program. It's a huge project lasting several decades funded by the Australian government to evaluate the status of the reef and try to find uh, some ways to keep it healthy and improve its current situation and try to s reduce the effects of climate change and pollution. Uh, so we are building the data management system for this project. So we're sitting in the, that light blue rectangle over there. And what this data management system is supposed to do is collect data from several providers and make it available to the decision makers of the Reef Authority through a couple of APIs uh, and some uh, S3 buckets. Uh, our, we were commissioned to do that, but we actually also want to make this data open and available to everyone because uh, most of the data we're collecting is actually public. So if we just put it all together, it doesn't make sense to then close it down. Uh, and we can deal with some uh, sensitive data in a separate way and not make that one available generally. But um, so how are we publishing this data? Very quickly, we are using the Spatial Temporal Asset Catalog as a metadata catalog. Um, we um, ha are using Stack Browser, which is a nice uh, open source platform uh, that allows you to have a good interface for searching for data. You can use spatial and temporal filtering. You can search for keywords, and you can see uh, what kind of data sets are available. Uh, these will soon be available at this URL. We are uh, still in a development phase, but we'll go into production and make it available by the end of the year. Um, we have also another API, the Data API, which is based on PyGeo API. It, which is an open implementation of the OGC standards. And this also has a browser interface, but that's not the main point. The main point is that this can act as um, a way for to enable machine-to-machine -machine communication. So uh, people can write scripts that talk to uh, our system and uh, use it to select 
um, subsets of some data sets based on uh, spatial filtering or uh, variable filtering and stuff like that. This will also be available by the end of the year. Now, uh, how are we dealing with this uh, wide variety of data? We, at the start of the project, we looked at the data sets that we were supposed to handle, and we found out that they can be grouped in two categories. We have tabular data and raster data. So tabular data is um, usually organized in rows and columns. Uh, it can be, uh, it's most commonly available as a CSV. Uh, it can be geospatial data, so we could have GeoJSON or other formats. Uh, sometimes we even have to deal with Excel spreadsheets. Uh, but we found out that we can convert all the tabular data we get of any kind to parquet, and I'll say more about that in a second. Uh, raster data, it's uh, multi-dimensional gridded data. When I say raster, you probably thinking of maps and geothiefs and stuff like that. We have some of that, but the largest amount of raster data we get is actually produced by ocean models, so there are physical, biological models of the ocean that uh, simulate what's happening in the Great Barrier Reef in this case. Uh, over the course of several years, they can have very high resolution and that means the data can get very large. We have some data sets uh, that are several terabytes of data. Uh, they are commonly, uh, the classical way of storing this data is in the form of NetCDF files. Uh, but we found that we can convert all this NetCDF and GeoTIFF and any other raster data to ZAR. Now, Parquet and ZAR, what's special about these formats? Uh, they are what's, what is called analysis-ready cloud-optimized formats. And this is a bunch of buzzwords. Uh, but what this means is that they are designed to be processed with parallel jobs. So you, we can do some parallel processing that's very efficient on this data, and we can easily and efficiently select subsets of this data. These two properties together mean that they are very suitable for remote use on the cloud. We can store data on the cloud somewhere. In our case, we're using S3 buckets, and people can connect to these buckets and do some analysis where the um, uh, libraries will take care of downloading only the parts of the data that are needed for the analysis we're running. So you don't need to store all of these data sets on locally, but you can operate remotely. And we've just heard from the previous talk about how good of a thing this can be. Um, so this is uh, ideal for large data sets because you don't want to store terabytes of data on your compute to be able to analyze it. And especially if these data sets are of interest to many groups and organizations, we can have a, a single central up-to-date copy of the data and all the different groups can connect to it and do uh, whatever uh, analysis they want to do. So a uh, brief look at how these formats are structured. Parquet is a columnar storage format. So normally, if you think of, for example, a CSV file, you have each row of the data one after the other. In a columnar storage format, you have each column of the data coming one after the other. This uh, is a small change, but gives uh, a few interesting properties. In particular, we can do some efficient compression of the data. Uh, it's easy to select a few columns from a very large data set. And this has also some advantages in parallelization. Uh, Parquet stores um, an index at the end of the file. They, they call it the metadata section. And this index uh, allows libraries to look at it and know which section of the file they need to read for uh, any query the user is currently running. So you don't need to uh, search through all of the file to find information you're looking for. Um, this is good for tabular data, but we are often dealing with geospatial data. Uh, so we use an extension of Parquet called GeoParquet. Uh, this simply adds one more column to each uh, table, and this column is the geometry column. It encodes spatial information in well-known binary, so we can record, we can encode 
here uh, any kind of shapes with their own uh, reference system. And this column is just stored as binary data. If you use any library that can deal with Parquet, you will see a binary column. But some libraries, although this, the support is a bit more limited, um, some libraries can understand GeoParquet and can see this column for what it is as, in this example, a series of points, but they can be any shape. Now, ZAR for raster data, uh, it's a format that uh, splits the data in chunks. So we have a large space, we uh, divide it with a grid into tiles. Uh, this grid can be two-dimensional if we have a map, but it can be three-dimensional, can be four-dimensional if we have three dimensions and time. Um, and then each of the tiles of this grid is stored in a separate file. So in, with ZAR we get a folder uh, containing lots of files, and we get one metadata file, which is uh, stored in JSON, that acts again as an index, so we know which of all of these uh, tiles we need to read if we are interested in a particular subset of the data. Um, so there is, we decided to use these two formats, but there was still one problem. Um, the metadata problem. So I've mentioned the word metadata a couple of times already, but what the format specifications call as metadata is just information about the structure of the files. What we usually intend as metadata is information about the data itself. So uh, it can be um, a description of uh, the data set, it can be uh, the units used by some variables or stuff like that. ZAR has uh, very good support for metadata. We can encode attributes for each of the variables. We can encode global attributes for the whole data set. Parquet is not as good. In theory, the, the specification um, is uh, supporting the same kind of metadata. We can record global attributes and we co record attributes for each of the columns of the data set. In practice, we found out that different libraries working with Parquet will encode this metadata in different ways. And this means uh, it's not really interoperable. If you write the data with one li the metadata with one library, uh, you can't read it with another one. That's not great if you want to make your data open and usable. And so we introduced one more tool, frictionless data. Frictionless data is a very nice open source format uh, for a framework for um, encoding metadata about any kind of data sets, no matter uh, the format of the data you're using. So the main feature of the frictionless uh, framework is the data package. This is a JSON file that you would distribute together with the data. It has a number of keywords, uh, such as name, title, description, where you can encode information about the data set. And it's flexible enough that you can use, uh, you can add any number of extra keywords that you need, need for your specific purpose. There are several libraries uh, able to uh, understand and work with uh, frictionless files, but it's, since it's a simple JSON file, you can open it with a text editor and read it yourself, or you can use any, um, any function that can deal with JSON to operate on that. Um, Another nice feature of frictionless is the table schema. This is designed for tabular data. And it's another file, again in JSON, where we can uh, store information about the columns of a table. This, again, works for uh, any kind of tabular data. In our case, we will use it with Parquet. And we can store stuff like the, a description of the data contained in a column. We can store the format of the data in the column, and we can even uh, encode some constraints, such as uh, this column needs to have unique values, or the maximum value you can have in this column is 200, or other things. And uh, libraries that can work with frictionless can automatically validate um, these constraints against a wide range of formats, including Parquet. Unfortunately, there is not an equivalent to the table schema for raster data, but uh, as we mentioned before, we were quite happy about the way ZAR stores metadata, and so uh, for now we uh, keep we will use the table schema for tabular data and encode uh, metadata directly in the ZAR files. Now, 
uh, I want to show you a practical example of what our work is. So we are getting data from uh, any kind of place, we are getting any kind of data, and what this means is for each data set we need to write a pipeline that converts this data to the formats we're using. In some cases it's very easy, we use, for example, GDAL. GDAL can, knows about ZAR, knows about GeoParquet, and we can just simply take some good data set, pass it through GDAL, and get the data we need. In other cases, it's less practical. So this is one of the data sets we got. It was uh, the result of a survey they did on the coast near the Great Barrier Reef region. And they asked people a bunch of questions, and they recorded the answer in a nice Excel spreadsheet. Uh, <laughs> we found a few issues with this data. So for example, uh, we have these column headers that are uh, entire paragraphs, basically. We have <laughs> several sentences composing the name of a column. This is not very practical because when you want to use the data, you may want to select a number of columns and you select them by name. And if that's the name you have to type, you're gonna get tired very quickly. <laughs> so what did we do? We tried to replace each column name with a single, wor single word or a code. These, several of these columns actually had a code, but then they also had a bunch of other things stuck together. Um, and then, although we don't, we would try never to modify the data, never to delete information that's in the data, so all these uh, longer names, we still keep them, but we put them as an entry in the table schema for each column, for the metadata of each column. Uh, the table schema, again, is a flexible uh, schema, so we can add any keyword and value we want to it, and this was very useful for this case. Another issue, this Excel file actually had several worksheets, and uh, one of them had extra information about each column of the, of the data. So we had, for example, um, the full question that was asked to people answering to this survey for each column. This is also information we would like to, to maintain and to provide to the users. And again, this is uh, perfectly suitable to put into the metadata of the, uh, of the data set we're, uh, we're providing. The only issue was matching these, uh, the rows of this uh, table with the columns of the main table, because again, the columns of the main table didn't have very nice names. But uh, with a bit of work, we managed to do that and uh, keep all the extra information. Uh, another issue was we had, again, another table uh, that was explaining some of the values contained in the main data. So for example, one of the questions was which town or LGA are you coming from? And the answer encoded there is a number, like 10. Uh, if you look at this table, you will know that uh, town number 10 is Uromba. Uh, this is not a uh, global conversion, it's not a standard in any way, but uh, it's uh, in order to understand the data, you need to look at this table. Now, this could be distributed as an extra table together with the main data table, but we decided to do something a bit better and a bit more practical. So for each of the columns in the main data set that had uh, information encoding in encoded in this way, we added an extra column with the decoded information. So if now you have one row saying town 10, you will also have an another column saying town label Uromba. Um, we keep both uh, kinds of information because in some cases um, the numbers are ordered and you may want to deal with the number values directly instead of the labels, but you're free to choose which ones you want. But this brings to the last problem I mentioned, uh, not the last problem this data set had, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in the end, we ended up with 1,200 something columns. That's a lot, especially for the kind of data it is. Uh, how did we solve this issue? We didn't. So we said, we don't care. Uh, these formats are made for selecting a small subset of the data. You have a thousand columns, but you only need two of them. 
you select those two columns and you can work as efficiently as, as if only those, those two columns were part of the data. That said, maybe this wasn't the best way of representing these data sets. So we are in contact with the data provider and we are talking to them about how they can organize their data better for the future. Um, so these are the people working on this project, the full team, we are seven people, uh, Eduardo, Michaela, Julia, Leo, David, and Denise are working with me. But I also want to acknowledge Alex and Nick who have done a lot for the start of this project and for setting it in the FOS4G direction. So thank you. And if you want any more information, you can write me an email at this address or write the whole group an email at the second address. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Leo. Have we got any questions? Alex? Straight there. <laughs> Hello, hello, hello. You've got a fantastic architecture. Who designed this? No, that's a joke. <laughs> um, question is, you are, you're talking about using frictionless as a metadata format for your Parquet files. Now, uh, so Space Jet Temporal Asset Catalog is also a JSON file that can live next to a, a, data, a data set. Uh, can you talk about the, um, I guess, the, the, the reasoning for having uh, another one? Um, yes. So. Stack has, um, is a has a way to represent metadata as a JSON file uh, with some very strict rules. So you need to use the exact keywords that Stack wants to understand. And then in addition to Stack, we also had PyGeo API, which has a configuration file where we need to store a bunch of metadata about each data set we want to serve. So we were starting to have duplicated information in several places and we were still needing to have a way to provide metadata to the public. So frictionless is now uh, our center point where we store metadata information about each data set. And then we have some automated workflows that get a frictionless data package and extract all the information needed to generate the stack configuration, the PyGA API configuration. So now we curate uh, the data package files partially, uh, they are partially human curated and partially automatically generated. So we get all the information we have about a data set in there. And then we can use that both to provide to the users and to uh, serve our uh, API systems. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, I've been involved a little bit in the Pi Geo API project. I just wondered if you're using the JSON LD, the link data for JSON. Uh, no, we are not. Uh, but I'd be definitely interested in hearing more about that. Actually, for Pi Geo API, we've done some uh, modifications to some of the providers that we were using to um, read the data and distribute it. And we're interested in contributing these uh, changes to the main PyJPI repository. We just haven't had the time yet, but uh, yeah, we should definitely talk more about that. Cool, thanks. Right, I think we need to wrap that up.